Our assigned topic for this month is revival. In case you wonder why every speaker is talking about revival. <clears throat> but I've added a little bit to the title. And you'll see why as we study. Revival by the power of the Holy Spirit through prayer. In uh, starting our study, we want to look at Ephesus, Revelation 2, verses 4 and 5. We're going to look at just one, which would be the main problem that Ephesus had. It says, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So obviously they had it. They knew what it was like to experience their first love, but then they did not cherish it. They did not consider it important enough to keep, and so they lost it. There might be some here tonight that you, you can look back. You know how to measure it. If you can look back in your Christian experience, and there's a time where you are more on fire to study your Bible or pray or to witness than you are now, and you've, you've started at least to lose your first love. And some people might have lost it to a large extent. Now, there could be some here that never got it. So if you never had it, then you don't know what you're missing. But hopefully you can hear somebody that has it so that you get an idea of what it's like to have your first love experience. Now, I've had the privilege of witnessing a lot of people in their first love experience. And here's what often happens. I usually study one time a week with people that are interested in studying the Bible. And pretty soon, they're so excited about the Bible, they're asking, could we study more? And it's not a case where, oh no, I forgot to study the Bible today. But you find out that they are just at home, they're just, you know, grabbing every opportunity and so on to, to read it and to pray, and, and nobody has to prompt them because it's so wonderful to them. And that's pretty consistent with people that are first finding an experience with Jesus. But one of the saddest things is that as time goes on, <clears throat> many times we don't preserve that. And you know, there's a story in the Bible that tells us what happens when we don't preserve it. Jesus was 12 years old, and he was in the temple, and for the first time he was understanding as a child the meaning of the sacrifice. So it was so important to him that he didn't go with his parents when they left. And they made the mistake of not making sure he was with them, and so they traveled all day, and it wasn't until night that they started realizing, Jesus is not here. He's gone. Well, they searched for a while, but they didn't find him, so they said, we've got to go back. So it took three days to find him. One day of neglecting him took three days to find him. So... Your first love experience that you had in the beginning, you probably got it even without asking. He just poured it out on you. But you won't get it again the same way. Well, I shouldn't say you won't. God can do what he wants to do, but generally, you don't get it back the same way. They had to hunt for three days to find him, and the book, Desire of Ages, explains 
that that is a lesson for the rest of us. Don't give up. If you don't have the love of the Bible, you don't have the love of prayer that you used to have. But I liked what our speaker said this week, show up, you know, that's the thing. <coughs> Excuse me if you're faithful. You will get it back. He wants to give it back to you. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Is it a serious matter? You can't just say, oh, I lost my first love. But he understands. No, God says, you sinned. I, I gave you something really precious, and you lost it. You need to repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. Wow, that's serious words, quickly. And I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So God says, you're, you're on borrowed time. You Remember, this is the apostolic church we're talking about. And he said to them, you're going to lose and your candlestick is going to be gone if you don't repent quickly. And so if there's anyone here tonight, I believe the same message is given to you. And if you, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, recognize that it either diminished or it went away, then this message is especially for you. Now, I started thinking about the similarity between the problem that Ephesus had and the problem that Laodicea has. We all accept the fact that the Adventist church is Laodicea. Now, I don't believe that every member of the Adventist church is in the Laodicean condition, but there's so many people that are in that condition that it describes our church in general. Because thou art lukewarm. Doesn't that sound like they lost their first love? Because you're lukewarm. And neither cold. Now cold is before we find Christ at all. It says you're not cold and you're not hot. Hot is when you have your first love. I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, those that look at the actual words say, I'm about to spew you out. I haven't, you know, I haven't started yet, but I'm, I'm at a point where it's not going to be long. And then I started thinking, do you know, Seventh-day Adventist became Laodicean in 1856. That's the first time the message came to this church. Wow, do we serve a merciful God. He's waited 160, I think it was, years. And he said, when we first became Laodicean, I'm just about to spew you out. I think our time is running out. And we need to really get it, that first love experience. Then he describes what happens when you don't have your first love and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Could you think of any worse list of accusations than that? That's serious. So he says, be zealous therefore, and repent. Then I started thinking, I wonder if... Laodicea has all the problems that existed in the seven churches. Well, we've already established that we have the problem of Ephesus, that so many people have lost their first love. Praise God, not all. And the ones that haven't are the ones 
that are helping to turn this world upside down, but just imagine what could happen if everybody got it again. Pergamus allowed those who taught the doctrine of Balaam to exist in the church, and they also taught or, or they allowed the people that were the Nicolaitans to be in the church. Now, I understand Glanville is going to give you a series on the seven churches, but let me just say briefly, the easiest doctrine of Balaam to understand is covetousness, materialism. That's what our Sabbath school class is about this quarter. Why? Because the church leaders recognized that materialism is a big problem in the Adventist church. And so we have the doctrine of Balaam alive. But there's another part of the doctrine of Balaam that's not quite as obvious, but if you study the story, you realize that it's too interested in sexual things. And Balaam recognized that if he could get the improperly dressed women over to the Israelite camp that he could entice them to go over to Moab and fall. And that's exactly what happened. And we're warned that just before Jesus comes, the devil is going to do it again. The amount of this going on in the Adventist church is very serious. And I'm not going to get into that tonight. The other problem is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, basically, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is that you really don't need to obey. You should obey, but don't really worry if you don't obey, because Jesus took care of it all. He paid the price. He, he's gotten all your sins covered, and just enjoy being a disciple of Jesus. In fact, as I travel the world, I am amazed how that is spreading in the Adventist church. And you can get in trouble for preaching the truth in a lot of places. That's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and Jesus said, I hate that doctrine. Why? Because we stop short of the potential that he has for us. Yes, it's exciting. Our sins are covered. That's how we can get started. That's how we can be thankful to God that he doesn't hold against us what we did before and even the mistakes that we keep on making, but he doesn't leave us there. He, he cleans us up. If we don't think we're going to get cleaned up, we won't, of course. We can't rise any higher than our expectations. Thyatira allowed those who taught the doctrine of Jezebel. Well, it's interesting. What is the doctrine of Jezebel? Well, there's two, probably, main things. Number one, she was a leader in worshiping false gods. Could we say she was a leader in changing the worship style because it was felt that the old worship style was not fulfilling. And so she wanted to see through the prophets of Baal that the worship style would change. And she succeeded for a while until Elijah was blessed to kill all those prophets and things uh, changed there. But we see what her doctrine was. A second doctrine she had is that she believed that women should control men because they're too despicable, you know? And we need to be the ones in charge. How do we know that? When he wanted Naboth's vineyard, he didn't go get it. He was chicken to go get it. But he knew that his wife could get it for him, and she did. She got it for him. She, nobody could stand in front of Jezebel. In fact, even Elijah got scared. That's why he ran, 
because he was so scared of Jezebel. But that doctrine, we see evidence of both of these doctrines rearing their head again and being allowed. You know, I was at a camp meeting a number of years ago. I won't say where it was, but the speaker was Doug Batchelor. And the Lord had impressed him to talk about the Baal worship, and the worship lake was at the foot of Mount Sinai by the kind of music that's being used and some of the other things that are being used. He said, during his sermon, he said, I probably will not be asked here to speak again. And his words were prophetic. He was not asked to speak again. So, it's coming up and it's not getting dealt with, and it's not getting stopped. Now, I happen to know from being in some meetings where our new president, he's not so new anymore, but Ted Wilson, he doesn't agree with this, but he hasn't been able to stop it. It's, there's too much power behind it, and so he hasn't been able to, even though I know he would like to. Sardis. In that church, it says that some people thought the Sardis church was alive, but God says, no, they're dead. So they went from losing their first love to being dead. Now, there are two other churches, but nothing negative is said because Smyrna was in a better condition due to persecution. Isn't that interesting? How many of us want to have persecution so the church gets pure? You know, well, there's one, two, okay. Uh, but, you know, most of us, we don't want persecution. That's what helps the church a great deal. Philadelphia is another one. And the reason this church didn't have problems is because they were experiencing Pentecost. They were receiving the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so that's another way. Maybe we, many of you would rather have that way than persecution. But in order to get there, we have to, you know, be willing to say, Lord, we are sorry we lost our first love and we want to have it back again. And we're not going to give up until we get it back. Well, what is revival? In Review and Herald of February 25, 1902, it says, revival signifies three things. Number one, a renewal of spiritual life. That's where the hot comes in. That's where the fire comes in. We have a renewal of spiritual life. Number two, a quickening of the powers of mind and heart. So now, when you open up your Bible, you're saying, wow, I didn't see that before. Isn't that beautiful? Why, what's happening? A revival took place, and so there's a quickening of the powers of the mind and the heart. You know, I always like to talk to William because he's always got something exciting that he read. Or that blessed his soul. And this is what God wants to do for everybody. That we should not be denied that. Number three, a resurrection from spiritual death. Now, we might not be all the way dead. I have another quote that talks about that. But some might be all the way dead. So, revival is intended to cure those three problems. To raise people from the dead, if they're dead, to quicken their power so that the Bible is exciting again and prayer is exciting, and to give them a, a renewal of their spiritual life. That's why we're told this in First Selected Messages 121, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. The greatest, the most urgent of our needs. What should we do? 
to seek this should be our first work. So if this week hasn't already started you on that path, tonight is the time to start. To make this our first work, a revival of true godliness among us. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord. Not because God is not willing to bestow his blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. So a lot of times we don't keep after him because we think, well, he doesn't want to do it. Maybe later he'll do it, but right now he doesn't want to do it. That's not true. He wants to do it more than we do. And so the only way he can accomplish it is to get us interested and to make the changes that are required so that he can do it. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give his Holy Spirit to them that ask him than our earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work, and here's a little detail on what is our work, by confession, so the Holy Spirit will bring things to our mind that we need to confess, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer, to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us his blessing. And here's how prayer fits in. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. So not only should we want to get our first love back, but we should recognize that prayer is one of the tools that God has given us to get it back. And that's the only one, of, it says, it uses the word only here, unless people get serious about praying, they will not get their first love back again. They will not get the revival that they should get. 